All right. So what I want to preach on this evening is something that I actually think is pretty is pretty important. And um, the title of my sermon is End Times Signs to Look For. Now, I do believe it is important to understand Bible prophecy. Uh, it's important for many reasons. It's important to understand what's going to happen. And, and one of the main reasons for that is just so that we're not offended, right? So Jesus told his disciples, hey, I, I tell you about these things now so that when it comes to pass, you're not offended. So that way, when hard times come, when trials and tribulations come your way, you know, when you know about it in advance, you can be prepared for, you can be ready to go. And, you know, as Christians, when we look at end times prophecy, we see that there's a great tribulation coming. There's going to be a time of great trouble. There's going to be a time where, where Satan is going to rise to power. The Antichrist is going to come into power and he's going to wage war against the saints. He's going to wage war against those who claim the name of Christ. Okay, so hard times are going to come. That is why I believe it is important to just understand this. Now, it's not the most important thing. We know what the most important thing is our salvation. But you know what? All doctrine needs to be looked at as being important. If it's in the Bible, it's there for a reason. There's an entire you know, book of the Bible called the book of Revelation where, where future events are, have been revealed unto us. Events that haven't happened yet, by and large, or the vast majority of the book of Revelation, has not even taken place yet. It's there for us. It's there for our understanding and things like that. Now, all of that being said, I think that we also need to be very clear that we are looking to to Scripture as our authority for end times events. Now, this is an interesting subject. I've always been interested in end times events. There's a lot of people who just, oh man, I love, you know, I love the book of Revelation. And I love teaching on this. And they'll read all these books and listen to all these people just because it's an interesting thing. But we need to be careful, especially if you have a zeal and a special interest in end times events and prophecies that you don't start getting off base in where you're receiving information from and in what you're looking to to, to help you understand you know certain events and times and things like that everything that happens in this world you always have people saying well the end is near the end is near now look judgment is coming and we know that we're in the last days, okay? But not every single thing that ever happens necessarily is like, oh, see, this is the, the you know, that tsunami was the, the one, you know, this is what the Bible's talking about. Now, things like that are found in here, sure, but you got to be careful, first of all, to just start applying everything to just, you know, what, what, you know, one place where the Bible mentions something. But more than just that, what, what I want to, the reason why we start off in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, look down at verse number 20 there. We're going to reread a few of these verses. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, this is talking about salvation in the context. We'll get this in the context. We're going to start in verse number 20. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world. For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. So before we get down into the next couple verses, what the Bible's teaching here is that in the world and all of its wisdom, right, wants to prove that there is no God. Or they want to prove like, yes, these atheists, you know, they want to sound so smart and they have all of this wisdom that we don't know God because we're so wise, right? To which God just laughs. I mean, he created everything. He's real. He exists. Yet this world wants to just have all this so-called wisdom that they have, that they, know, they don't even know God through their wisdom. Their wisdom is foolishness with God, which is why it says it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. So God doesn't try to get on their level, the world's level of, oh no, we need to have this wisdom and you need to be able to prove to me, you know, you need to be able to prove with a formula that God exists and every, you know, God's not gonna do that. 
You know what he uses? He uses preachers. Amen. He uses preachers of his word. You either believe it or you don't. Right. It's faith. Right. And, that, and you know what? It pleases God to have it that way. We can't change that. It's just, that's God's design. He says this is the way it is, right? So, this isn't what the whole sermon's about, but I want you to understand the, con the context <laughs> before we get in these next verses because he's comparing just using the foolish of the preaching to confound the wise, the wisdom of this world. Look at verse number 22. The Bible says, For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, unto the Jews a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks foolishness, but unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. What is this passage talking about? It's talking about why are the Jews not believing? Because they require a sign. They need some other proof. We need something else. We need you to do some other sign. That's why they said to Jesus, well, hey, you got to show us a sign. And what about the Greeks? The Greeks seek after wisdom. What wisdom? The wisdom of the world. Right? The same wisdom of the world that's going to deny God. That's what this passage is talking about. It's talking about salvation. It's talking about why they're not saved. It's talking about the preaching of Christ crucified. That's why it's a stumbling block to the Jews. Because they're seeking after a sign, and you know what? They're not going to get one. But how many times do the preachers of the end times prophecy, and you need to be looking for these events, and there's all these signs and the stars and everything else, say, well, the Jews require a sign. I can't tell you how many times I've heard false prophets and false teachers and people that want to get up and say, we, oh, but the, the, the Mercury and Venus are all in alignment now and this hasn't happened for this many years. You know, and they start going off on all of these, star, these stargazers start going off on how all of these things in, this, in, the, in, the, in the atmosphere and in the, in the sky and the heavens, all this stuff is happening. Well, the Jews seek after a sign. So we need to be looking for the heavens for a sign. And now we know that the end times is coming because here's the sign that the Jews require. The context of this verse is talking about a sign to believe in Jesus. And what did God do if they require a sign? Now think about this. If God is going to provide a sign for anything... Wouldn't he be providing a sign so that they would be saved? Why, is he wor why would he worry about the Jews that require a sign? Why would he worry about giving them a sign about the end times and not about salvation? It makes no sense. If he takes the attitude that says, hey, they're seeking after a sign, and they're not going to get it. And by the way, turn if you would to Matthew chapter 12. And they're not going to get it for salvation, for their souls being saved and going to heaven. Why is he going to think that it matters that they understand end times prophecy? Yet I can't tell you how many people I've seen and heard and just heard it just repeated. Well, the Jews seek after a sign, so that's why there's going to be these signs in the heavens. And they're going to, you know... And, and who knows where they get, well, because the planets are lining up, this is that sign. How do you know that? You just make stuff up. The end times signs that we need to be looking for should be found in Scripture. And if you can't find them in Scripture, don't worry about it. Because you're always going to have people spouting off all this stuff. I mean, I've, I get, and, and look, you guys may not deal with this very much. I get emails, phone calls, whatever, from people who just, oh man, I've got this insider information. You're going to be blown away. You will not believe the information that I've got for you. Pastor Burzins, you're, man, you are going to just want, you're, you just, you won't know what to do yourself after you hear this information that I've got for you. And then it's on and on and on about these stars. And, you know, I mean, back a few years ago, was, have you heard of Planet X? Have you heard, you know, this is what's going to happen. It's coming here. And you know what they always do? They set dates. 
all these people that are looking at the stars and they use their little apps and they say, see, look, now this is what's going to happen here. And this is, you know, and it's going to happen on this date. They turn into date setters. Watch out for the people that are date setters. Seriously. Now, look, I'm not saying that the people that do that are bad people. Because a lot of people that just get really caught up in prophecy, and unfortunately, they may end up looking at and reading and these days, just YouTubing and, and, see, and just following people that they don't really know anything about that may or may not even be saved, but because they're so interested in end time stuff, they just, they just eat up all of this stuff and end up walking away with garbage. The sign that the Jews needed and wanted, and see, there's going to be signs because the Jews need to understand that the end times are coming. Well, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, God's not giving them a sign for salvation, which was, again, the context of that passage. But look what the Bible says in Matthew 12, verse 38. The Bible says, Then certain of the scribes and of the Pharisees answered, this is talking to Jesus Christ, saying, Master, we would see a sign from thee. So, yeah, they're looking for a sign. But what does Jesus respond to the Pharisees with? An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given to it, but the sign of the prophet Jonas. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. That's the sign that you get. It's the, it's the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Believe that. There's your sign. That Jesus Christ's soul went to hell for three days and three nights and rose again from the dead. That's the sign I'm going to give you. <clears throat> he's, not giving, he's, not, he's not caving in to just giving them some sign because they seek after a sign. He says, you know what? You're evil and wicked for even asking for a sign. Why don't you just have faith? Why don't you just believe? And there's enough prophecy already that he's fulfilled. You don't need the sign to be looking after. I'm going to cover... Because specifically the stars thing is like one of the biggest areas that people will turn to to try to tell you, oh man, yeah, this is what we're, we're, I had someone recently tell me that like, we're already in the tribulation. Who's the Antichrist? And that, and that it's actually like the rapture is going to happen like really soon. Sorry, that's not how I read the Bible. I haven't seen the signs. Now, this is important because when you read the scripture, we see warning after warning from Jesus and others about not letting anyone deceive you on end times events, on end times prophecy. So yes, it is important. And we're going to get to that later in the sermon. I'm going to try to make it through this debunking and just showing to you how silly it is to be looking to the stars and the planets and, and everything else. Um, first of all, beware of the people who do the numerology, if, you, if you're familiar with that. That's where people are saying, you know, they really, really, really focus on the numbers. And they end up doing some crazy math, like, you know, because well, here's the, first of all, the Bible does use specific numbers, and there's something to be, to, you know, to be gleaned from that and to learn, and there's, there's specific reasoning for it. You know, the number 40, the number 12, the number 7, the number 3, these are all, you know, numbers that are used repetitively in Scripture, and they do have meaning, okay? So I'm not saying that there's just no meaning to the numbers and stuff in the Bible, but it has its limits. It has its limits. You can't just start saying... Well, when it says this here, you know, this means that, you know, there's going to be, I know it says there's seven years, but those seven years are actually seven jubilees. And then those seven jubilees, you know, it's every 50 years. So seven times 300, so it's time 50 is 350. And then that 350 is actually, you know, if you double that, that's 700. And see, 700 is like the seven days of Daniel's week. And it, it's like, where do you get this stuff? You conjure up things. Show me in Scripture how you could even follow that path. But, I mean, you, you see it all the time anyways. It's out there on the Internet and some people. It's like, and if you just double it, it's like, well, 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 hold on a second. Why are you doubling it? Oh, because you needed it to fit whatever it is that you already think. You're just trying to find numbers to make this stuff work. And it's like, oh, man, my mind's blown. This is so crazy. I can't believe this is all here. It's not. 
It's in your imagination. If you want to just make some numbers say something, you can do it. And you could follow some really uh, complicated methods of coming up with your formulas from the Bible and think you've cracked the code. This is what we're being warned about. Let no man deceive you. Okay? Watch out for that stuff and watch out for the people. Turn if you go to Isaiah 47 that are pointing to the stars as their proof of, oh, this is, this is when this is going to happen, and these are the dates, and this is when it's going to happen and take place. When I say watch out for the date setters, because the Bible says that no man knoweth the day or the hour when the Son of Man is going to return. Okay, nobody knows. Now, eventually, at some point, you may be able to figure it out, but that's going to be when you're, when you're really close, and it's going to be after the events that were specifically told about in Scripture actually come to pass. Like the abomination of desolation being set up. Okay, that would be something that you might be able to turn to and be like, okay, well, we know that this happened here, so there's only this much time left. Or, you know, we'll get into that in a little bit, though. I don't want to get too far ahead of myself. Here's what the Bible has to say in Isaiah 47 about people who are pointing to the stars as a proof, because this is nothing, there's nothing new under the sun, and people have constantly been looking to the sky and the stars to give them some extra prophetic knowledge and, and visions of the future and what's going to happen, because they think it's all written in the stars. Isaiah 47, verse 8, the Bible reads, Therefore, hear now this, thou that art given to pleasures, that dwellest carelessly, that sayest in thine heart, I am and none else beside me, I shall not sit as a widow, neither shall I know the loss of children. But these two things shall come to thee in a moment in one day, the loss of children and widowhood. They shall come upon thee in their, excuse me, in their perfection, for the multitude of thy sorceries and for the great abundance of thine enchantments. For thou hast trusted in thy wickedness, thou hast said, none seeth me, thy wisdom and thy knowledge, it hath perverted thee. And thou hast said in thine heart, I am and none else beside me. Therefore shall evil come upon thee, thou shalt not know from whence it riseth, and mischief shall fall upon thee, thou shalt not be able to put it off, and desolation shall come upon thee suddenly, which thou shalt not know. Stand now with thine enchantments, and with the multitude of thy sorceries, wherein thou hast labored from thy youth. If so be, thou shalt be able to profit, if so be, thou mayest prevail. Look at verse number 13. Thou art wearied in the multitude of thy counsels. Let now the astrologers, the stargazers, the monthly prognosticators stand up and save thee from these things that shall come upon thee. God is judging these people for their wickedness and for all this great wisdom and knowledge that the Bible said in verse 10, it's perverted you. And you're seeking to these stargazers. Now, it says astrologers first, but you know what? These aren't all necessarily the same people, right? Obviously, astrology is wicked. That's the zodiac stuff and people looking to, to the stars for that. But not only the astrologers, just the stargazers, right? The people who are looking for their information in the stars and the monthly prognosticators. Every month, they've got, they're, they're telling you what's going to happen based on the signs of the times, right? What they're seeing externally. Stand up, and he's like, let them now save you. Why is he saying that? Because they don't have the truth. They're not going to be able to save them. Because they're looking to the wrong place for their source of information. Verse 14 says, Behold, they shall be as stubble. The fire shall burn them. They shall not deliver themselves from the power of the flame. There shall not be a coal to warm at, nor fire to sit before it. We need to take heed to that same warning because when you listen to the stargazers, the monthly prognosticators, the astrologers, okay, the wisdom that you receive from that could pervert you and get you off track into from what's right. Now, we know, especially this time of year, if you read Luke 2, that there was a star in heaven that helped the wise men find Jesus Christ and was a guide to them. That is true. 
Okay, that happened. But if you're going to say, well, because of that, now there has to be some other star or comet or alignment or whatever in Scripture, you have to be able to prove from Scripture that it's actually there. I'm not saying it's impossible since it has happened in the past. I'm not saying it's just 100% impossible. But I have yet to hear anybody give an explanation from Scripture that, well, see, the Bible says this and this is this, that's not just completely ripped out of context and just, just not making any sense at all, but you just pick one verse and just say, like, oh, yeah, that's, uh, this is talking about this, and you have no substance to back that up with. I'm going to read, I have a lot of references to read, but I, I'm, I already knew this is, there's a lot here. I pulled just the Bible's references to stars, and I'm going to, we're going to read through most of these and trying to get them in the context of anything that might be prophetic or even closely associated with being prophetic. Because obviously there's references where God is going to bless Abraham and, and his seed is going to be like the stars innumerable, you know, things like that. I'm not talking about those references because he's clearly just talking about him having a lot of children because there's a lot of stars up in the sky, right? I'm talking about things that might give us any other insight. And if you want to follow, you can, but I need to go pretty quickly through these. We're going to start in Jeremiah chapter 31. We're going to go to Isaiah 14. Isaiah 14 is a good place to go to if you want to turn there. Isaiah, Jeremiah 31, verse 34, the Bible reads, And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me. From the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. Thus saith the Lord, which giveth the sun for a light by day, and the ordinances of the moon and of the stars for a light by night, which divideth the sea when the waves thereof roar, the Lord of hosts is his name. If those ordinances depart from before me, saith the Lord, then the seed of Israel also shall cease from being a nation before me forever. So basically, we, we see, even going back to Genesis, you know, God made the sun for a light by day and the moon and the stars for a light by night. That's what they're for. Obviously, there's other symbolic teachings that are referenced, the sun, the moon, the stars, and there's other learning we can get from them. And God in His infinite wisdom is able to use that stuff tremendously you know, I mean, even just the, the moon reflecting the light of the sun, the moon could be representative of, of us. We don't have our own light, but, you know, we reflect Jesus Christ's light, the sun, the son of God, right, in that, in, 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 in that regard. But I don't want to get too deep into that because, there's, you know, we could talk about that and use biblical references to support that. And it's teaching a truth that's already found in Scripture, and those are just pictures of it. But when you start coming up with stuff that's just not in Scripture at all, You know, there's, there's no way to support it. So, Isaiah 14, we're going to look at some of the references to stars in Scripture. And this one's important, too, because you got to be careful um, how you want to interpret things. Isaiah 14 is actually the reference, if you're reading a King James Bible, it's going to use the word Lucifer versus the morning star. And when you read the new, the modern translations of this, it's going to say, instead of Lucifer, it's going to say morning star, which is the name, or the, you know, the title or the name given to Jesus Christ in the book of Revelation, that Jesus Christ is the bright and morning star. So here being a you know, the morning star being attributed to Satan versus attributed to Jesus, there is a, a significant distinction there. But look at Isaiah 14, verse number 12. The Bible reads, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? And Lucifer literally means like a light bearer, right? We know that, that Satan is an angel of light, that he was, uh, you know, the anointed cherub, and that, and that he had this great position before sin was found in him and he fell, but he is a beautiful creature and, and it makes sense that he is this light bearer, even though he's, he's wicked, but that his name would be associated with him being a bright uh, creation of God, a bright, a bright angel. 
How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High, yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. And in the context, everything matches up perfectly that it's talking about Satan. Right? He's lifted up with pride. He wants to be like the Most High. And he's going to be cast down to hell. Obviously, it's not talking about Jesus Christ. So when Jesus Christ is referred to as a bright and morning star, not the same thing as Lucifer. Now, you'll hear people turn to these passages and say, well, see, the, sun, the, the, the morning star is Venus. Because that's what the, the star that you could still see in the sky just before dawn. It's that it's, it's still a bright star. It's called the morning star. You can still, still see it when, when dawn rises. And it's a planet. But see, when you start going that in-depth on things, you start getting into some really shaky territory because people used to worship the planets and the stars and the host of heaven and literally made gods out of these planets. Yeah. Mercury and Venus, right? And, and all the names of the planets that we have are these false gods. Yeah. And just because there's a reference to this morning star doesn't mean that, well, all of a sudden now that has to be part of Bible prophecy. Where do you get that from? And everything that I'm bringing up today, I've heard. So if you're sitting there going like, why are you even mentioning this? I would never in a million years even think that because it's out there. And I'm bringing up references to stars particularly just so that we can see and maybe hopefully all agree that like, <coughs> sorry, not seeing the, the, the big push to look at the stars to understand when the Great Tribulation is going to start. Okay, because that's not the place to look to. And after we get done with this exercise, we'll go to the passages that actually clearly spell out, here's what to look for, right? Because it's already there in Scripture. We don't need to go and, and try to sound extra smart. But see, there's an appeal. There's an appeal to this occult-type knowledge. And occult just means, you know, it's, it's, it's unknown, it's hidden. You want to know things that no one else knows, and this is this big secret, but now I know. This is the same attitude that many Jehovah's Witnesses have because they want to feel like they're so smart because there's already so many people who don't know the Bible at all. They, it's real easy for them to just pull the wool over people's eyes because people don't read their Bibles. They say, but do you know that the Bible says this and you know what the Bible says? And they have all their false facts or many false facts that they'll go and use to try to entice people. Say, oh man, wow, I never knew that before. And they think that like they have all these answers. And they don't. It's just, it's just more lies from their religion. And any occult practice, for that matter, I mean, whether it's Freemasonry, anything else, it's, you know, they're starting to give you this taste of, oh, did you know this and this? And like, no one knows this. And there's all these sheep out there. And no one really knows what's really going on. And as you graduate through these secret societies, you can learn more and more and more. The Illuminati, Luciferianism, it's all the same type of stuff. And there's an appeal for people to want to know. In all of us, I think there's an appeal to want to know the truth. But see, you're not going to find it that way. It's not, it's not hidden so deeply and darkly that, that God has made it impossible for you to really find it unless you go to these secret societies and stuff. He's given us a light. He's given us the truth. This is where you could find the truth. Are you seeking for the truth and you want to know the, the, the wisdom and the hidden knowledge? Well, open this up and it won't be hidden anymore. Read and study this book. It's right here. You don't need to find it anywhere else. And it's, and it's literally the satanic teaching that people want to exalt Lucifer, the light bearer, thing. oh, I'm going to be enlightened by going down Satan's path. I mean, that's what Luciferianism is, is that they, they actually look at Lucifer as, as, a good, as a good being. And some people even go as far as that's the true God and that Jehovah is, is not. That, that basically, like, the roles are reversed, like a total swap. That Jehovah is 
like the wicked one and, and Lucifer is the good one because he's the one that brought the, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And, you know, he just wants you to, to know and be smart and be wise and have all this. That's, that's how they spin it, the wickedness of Lucifer to be a good thing. And they play off of that because people, I mean, that's, well, whatever. I'm not going to get into all the different religions and stuff because it's easy to go down that path as well. Isaiah 14, no reason to say that this has anything to do with, with any end times prophecy stuff. There's consolations mentioned in Job 9, but again, nothing with any hint of prophecy tied to it. Turn, if you would, to Daniel chapter 8, because there's stars mentioned in Daniel's prophecy as well, and we'll see that. I'll read from Job 9 for you. It's not much. Job 9, 6 says, Which shaketh the earth out of her place, and the pillars are of tremble, which commandeth the sun, and it riseth not, and sealeth up the stars. Which alone spreadeth out the heavens, and treadeth upon the waves of the sea, which maketh Arcturus, Orion, and Pleiades, and the chambers of the south. Which doeth great things, past finding out, yea, and wonders without number. And it's talking about God that's, you know, he's able to shake the earth, the pillars tremble, he commands the sun, it doesn't ride, he can seal up the stars, and then it just makes mention to these constellations. Because people know them. Because it's something to make reference to that God is the creator of everything, and, you know, but it's not telling you more information about what, you know, that it has this extra purpose to it. Daniel 8, look at verse number 5. The Bible reads, And as I was considering, behold, an he-goat came from the west on the face of the whole earth and touched not the ground. And the goat had a notable horn between his eyes. And he came to the ram that had two horns, which I had seen standing before the river and ran unto him in the fury of his power. And I saw him come close unto the ram, and he was moved with choler against him and smote the ram and brake his two horns. And there was no power in the ram to stand before him, but he cast him down to the ground and stamped upon him. And there was none that could deliver the ram out of his hand. Therefore the he-goat waxed very great. And when he was strong, the great horn was broken. And for it came up four notable ones toward the four winds of heaven. And out of the one of them came forth a little horn, which waxed exceeding great toward the south and toward the east and toward the pleasant land. And it waxed great even to the host of heaven. And it cast down some of the host and of the stars to the ground and stamped upon them. Yea, he magnified himself even to the prince of the host, and by him the daily sacrifice was taken away, and the place of his sanctuary was cast down, and an host was given him against the daily sacrifice by reason of transgression, and it cast down the truth to the ground, and it practiced and prop prospered. Then I heard one saint speaking, and another saint said unto the certain saint which spake, How long shall be the vision concerning the daily sacrifice and the transgression of desolation to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden under foot. Now, I've heard some very elaborate interpretations of this story, believe it or not, involving astronomy and Venus and the stars and the alignment and stuff and trying to tie that with the he-goat and the ram and you see they came together and now they're here and this is what's happening in Daniel chapter 8. They focus on these darker sayings about he-goats and rams, and, and, and they start adding their own interpretation upon it. Now, did any of you get anything from this story with the he-goat and the ram that, you, that you're just going to be like, oh, of course, of course, Pastor Burson, that's talking about Mercury and Venus and Mars all coming into alignment on this date, and that is going to signify these events that are happening in Daniel's 70th week here that we read in Daniel chapter 8. Now, is Daniel chapter 8 talking about end times prophecy? Yeah, it is. But they focus on this part. They go off on these tangents then of information that's not found in the Bible. But if you just, can, and see, this is how they deceive people because they want to throw so much stuff at you as if they have a mountain of evidence. Like, oh man, see, but if you know this and this and this, and they, and they try to jump around faster than you can say, oh, hold on a second, let's just look at that. 
How about we just look at that in context? Because all you have to do, and this goes for regardless of what the teaching is, if someone's teaching you something that doesn't sound right, or you're going like, wait, what? I've never heard that before. Wait, how do you get that? Stop them and say, let's read that in context. That will 99% of the time debunk the false teaching that you're getting from someone who's just likes to pick and choose things out of context because you have to explain yourself then. If you just keep reading this chapter, the Bible actually tells you what these things mean. It explains the he-goat. It explains the ram. And guess what? It's not talking about planets. <laughs> But you still, you know, people still want to cling to this and say, no, I know it says all that, but this is still lining up in the stars. Like, don't tell me that your, your beliefs are all Bible-based when you can't find this stuff anywhere in the Scripture that it's referring to any planets or stars. It's just the thoughts of your own heart trying to make, trying to, to, to put your understanding into some natural events. Let's keep reading here. In verse 15, the Bible says, And it came to pass when I, even I, Daniel, had seen the vision and sought for the meaning, then behold, there stood before me as the appearance of a man. And what a great verse. Daniel has his vision. I, I don't know what this is. I want to know what it is. He prays to God. And you know what? God answers that prayer. And you, if you want to get wisdom, if you want to get knowledge, you know what the Bible says? Ask God, who giveth liberally and upbraideth not. You want to have wisdom? You don't understand the Bible? Pray to God that he opens up your understanding because he wants you to be wise. He wants you to have understanding. And if he sees that you're seeking and you're reading and you want the wisdom, he'll open it up for you. Imagine that. You don't have to turn to the monthly prognosticators. You don't have to turn to the astrologers. Now you do if you just want instant gratification and you just, I just want to know what this means right now. You'll have a bunch of people that will tell you anything. They're out there. Or you could wait on the Lord with patience. Read, study, pray, and look for your answer from the right source. <laughs> Daniel was, was trying to understand. He had his vision. I, he didn't know what it meant. But God explains it to him. Look at verse 16. I heard a man's voice between the banks of Uli, which called and said, Gabriel, make this man understand the vision. So he came near where I stood, and when he came, I was afraid and fell upon my face. But he said unto me, Understand, O son of man, for at the, at the time of the end shall be the vision. Now as he was speaking with me, I was in a deep sleep on my face toward the ground, but he touched me and set me upright. And he said, Behold, I will make thee know what shall be in the last end of the indignation. For at the time appointed, the end shall be. The ram which thou sawest, having two horns, are the kings of Media and Persia. He didn't say it's Venus and Mercury. It says, the kings of Media and Persia. And the rough goat is the king of Grecia. And the great horn that is between his eyes is the first king. Now that being broken, whereas four stood up for it, four kingdoms shall stand up out of the nation, but not in his power. And in the latter time of their kingdom, when the transgressors are come to the full, a king of fierce countenance and understanding dark sentences shall stand up, and his power shall be mighty, but not by his own power. And he shall destroy wonderfully, and shall prosper, and practice, and shall destroy the mighty and the holy people. And through his policy also he shall cause craft to prosper in his hand, and he shall magnify himself in his heart, and by peace shall destroy many. He shall also stand up against the prince of princes, but he shall be broken without hand. Wow. We saw this prophecy with rams and he goats and trying, what does that mean? And then the explanation is right there after it. Watch out for the people that are going to take you, oh, now check this out, now check this out. Wait, let's get it in context first. There are prophetic events where the stars are involved. But I'll tell you this much, it's consistent every time. Because the stars are involved in future prophecy, it hasn't happened yet. But it's not something you have to worry about following too closely 
when this event's going to happen. Um, turn, if you go to Joel chapter 2. Joel, the book of Joel in the Minor Prophets, chapter 2, before the New Testament. I'm going to read a few passages for you from Isaiah and Ezekiel. Isaiah 13, 9 says, Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, cruel, both with wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land desolate. He shall destroy the sinners thereof out of it. For the stars of heaven and the constellations thereof shall not give their light. The sun shall be darkened in his going forth, and the moon shall not cause her light to shine. That's talking about a prophetic event. That references the stars. It also references the sun and the moon. And guess what happens to them? They're darkened. There's no alignment going on. They're being darkened. You'll never guess this. We're going to see the same thing in Ezekiel. Ezekiel 32, verse 6 says, I will also water with thy blood the land wherein thou swimmest, even to the mountains, and the rivers shall be full of thee. And when I shall put thee out, I will cover the heaven and make the stars thereof dark. I will cover the sun with a cloud, and the moon shall not give her light. All the bright lights of heaven will I make dark over thee, and set darkness upon thy land, saith the Lord God. I will also vex the hearts of many people, when I shall bring thy destruction among the nations, into the countries which thou hast not known. Yea, I will make many people amazed at thee, and their kings shall be horribly afraid for thee, when I shall brandish my sword before them, and they shall tremble at every moment, every man for his own life, in the day of thy fall. And again, in Joel chapter 2. So what's going on with the sun and moon and stars? They're being darkened. They're not shining their light. Joel chapter 2, verse number 10. The Bible reads, The earth shall quake before them, the heavens shall tremble, the sun and the moon shall be dark, and the stars shall withdraw their shining. And the Lord shall utter His voice before His army, for His camp is very great, for He is strong and executeth His word, for the day of the Lord is great and very terrible, and who can abide it? We've already seen two references to the day of the Lord. Why? Because it's the same event. It's a prophetic event. It hasn't happened yet. And the signs that we see happening is the sun, moon, stars going dark. Joel chapter 3, verse number 13, the Bible says, Put ye in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. This is the reaping of the world. Come, get you down, for the press is full, the fats overflow, for the wickedness is great. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. For the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. The sun and the moon shall be darkened, and the stars shall withdraw their shining. You're looking for signs in the stars. These are the signs that are clearly laid out for us in the stars. The sun, the moon, and the stars going dark and not giving the light. But you know what? At that point, you won't need a sign if you understand the way that, that Scripture lays out Bible prophecy. Because at that point, you might as well look up because your redemption draweth nigh. I mean, that's, that's the day of Christ that happens right before the day of the Lord, which is the same day, by the way. But that's another sermon. I think I mentioned preaching on that before. Turn if you would to Luke chapter 21. I'm going to do my best to get through this as quickly as possible. I actually, Luke 21, Matthew 24, and Mark 13 are all parallel passages in Scripture. It's all the same preaching of Jesus. There's, there's a little bit of information that you get different from all of them. And I'd like to go through them as much as we can, and I'm going to get through these real quickly. Everything I've already mentioned, go ahead and look it up later on and read everything in context. Read Joel 2, read Joel 3, you know, get the whole context of the prophetic events and stuff. But I'll tell you what, look for sun, you know, for the stars and look for any signs that we're going to get. We already saw that God's not bowing down to the Jews to make signs for them because, you know, he, he, they need a sign. The attitude is actually, sorry, you're not getting a sign. The sign is that Jesus Christ died and rose again from the dead, that his soul went to hell for three days and three nights, just like Jonah was in the heart of the, of the whale, in the, in the belly of the whale. That's the sign that you get. And they're still not accepting that sign, so why are they going to be, why is God giving them any other signs? <coughs> but in Luke 21, Matthew 24, Mark 13, we actually have questions here. We're going to start reading in uh, verse number 7 here in Luke 21. The Bible reads, And they asked him, saying, Master, but when shall these things be? 
And what sign will there be when these things shall come to pass? And now, in context, if you go up a little bit, go up to verse number five, just so we get that. And as some spake of the temple, how it was adorned with goodly stones and gifts, he said, As for these things which ye behold, the days will come in the which there shall not be left one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. So he's talking about the destruction of the temple, right? And then they, stay, they ask him, okay, well, when's that going to happen? And what are the signs of when that's going to happen? I don't know about you, but if you're looking for signs of end times events happening, why don't we look at the place where the disciples asked, hey, what are the signs going to be? I know, it's, 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 it's hard to, to think of that because it's so much easier to go back to some dark sayings that have these references and symbolic meanings and just try to assign that to whatever your heart desires. Or we could just go and be like, hey, here's the answer. Like, what must, what, what must I do to be saved? Yeah, you could turn to all kinds of different parables to try to see, oh, see, look, you got to work and do this and that. Or you could just go where the question's asked, hey, what must I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved in the house. Great. That made it pretty easy, didn't it? <laughs> what are going to be the signs? Well, let's turn to this passage that said nothing about signs or end times, and let's just, just make up what we want to make up to believe out of that. Master, when shall these things be? Verse 7. And what, shall, what sign will there be when these things shall come to pass? Verse 8. And he said, Take heed that ye be not deceived. And in all the references, we're going to see him basically saying the same thing. Don't let anyone trick you. Don't be deceived. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and the time draweth near. Go ye not therefore after them. But when ye shall hear of wars and commotions, be not terrified, for these things must first come to pass, but the end is not by and by. So even with major wars and things like that, he's basically explaining, don't worry about it. There's going to be wars, but it's still not the end. Verse 10, Then said he unto them, Nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And we've been seeing that, right? Throughout history, nations rise against nation. Nothing to get all freaked out about. It happens. There's wars. Verse 11, And great earthquakes shall be in diverse places, and famines, and pestilences, and fearful sights, and great signs shall there be from heaven. Now, this is what people are going to focus on. Forget everything else. Great signs shall there be from heaven. If you have no other context and nothing else to say, you can't just start making up your own things of these are the great signs. The great signs are going to be, if, if, if you're not given any other detail, they're going to be obvious or they're going to be mentioned somewhere else. Okay, when the wormwood comes and the, you know, and, and the stars start to fall and things like that, those are going to be your signs. But look at verse number 12. It says, But before all these... But before all these, they shall lay their hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues and into prisons, being brought before kings and rulers for my name's sake. And it shall turn to you for a testimony. Settle it therefore in your hearts, not to meditate before what ye shall answer. For I will give you a mouth and wisdom, which all your adversaries shall not be able to gainsay nor resist. And ye shall be betrayed both by parents and brethren and kinsfolks and friends. And some of you shall they cause to be put to death. And ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. But there shall not an hair of your head perish. In your patience possess ye your souls. And when ye shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, then know that the desolation thereof is nigh. Then let them which are in Judea flee to the mountains, and let them which are in the midst of it depart out, and let not them that are in the countries enter thereinto. For these be the days of vengeance, that all things which are written may be fulfilled. But woe unto them that are with child, and them that give suck in those days. For there shall be great distress in the land, and wrath upon this people. And they shall fall by the edge of the sword, and shall be led ca away captive into all nations, and Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Now, I personally believe that some of this is being prophesied about the physical destruction of Jerusalem that actually happened because they're asking about the stones being removed, you know, the, the one stone not standing upon another that happened in 70 A.D. 
Okay? But there's also, and as we turn to some of the other passages we're going to see, they also ask about the end of the world. So it's not, he's giving them more than just the temple being destroyed. There's more to it than that. And as you continue to read, we'll see even more that he explains more. Verse number 25 says, And there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars. Signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars. When you read the Old Testament prophecy as well as New Testament, what is the sign that we see in the sun and the moon and the stars? The darkening, the not shedding, giving their light. Every single time. That's what we see. I, show me the other signs, and I'm open to hear about it, but show it to me from Scripture. You can't just take a, a, a phrase and say, well, see, look, there's, this, there's automatically be signs. Well, who are you then to say that that's the sign? And upon the earth, distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth, for the powers of heaven shall be shaken. And then shall they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. And when these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. So, what things? The things that he was just talking about here, men's hearts failing them for fear, looking for those things which are coming on the earth, for the powers of heaven shall be shaken. The powers of heaven being shaken is a significant event. Way more significant than, well, this hasn't happened in 700 years or in 1,000 years that these planets lined up. The heavens are shaken. It's not just everything continuing as it normally does. That's a serious event happening. Verse 27 says, And when they shall see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power in heaven, uh, great glory, and when all these things begin to come to pass, and look up and lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. And he spake to them a parable, and he goes on and on here. You could read the rest of that later. Let's go to Matthew 24. Verse number three, we're going to start reading. Because again, in verses one and two, he's talking about the stones being not left one upon the other. Verse three says, And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? So now they're asking him, not just, you know, here it's recorded, I should say, where it wasn't recorded in Luke, it's recorded here, that not only did they say, When shall these things be, but what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? Okay, so this is, these are all the questions that Jesus is answering. He's answering, yes, the question about Jerusalem being destroyed, about the temple being destroyed, but then he's also answering the questions about his coming and of the end of the world. Verse 4 says, And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. Right, same thing. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many, and you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. And again, people are always out there trying to say, Well, this war and this... It's the end times. Look, the wars are going to happen. What's greater, I think, is when you see everybody giving power unto one person for worldwide peace. That's a much greater sign than the wars. The wars are going to lead up to the solution of peace, of the new world order being put completely in place with the Antichrist getting the power of all the rulers of the world that he could be the one in charge in, in offering up peace by him and being in charge of everything. Verse 7, For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilences, earthquakes and diverse places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted, and shall kill you, and you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended, and shall betray one another, and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall rise, and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. Look at verse 15. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet stand in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand, 
Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Let him which is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house. Neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. Now, I'm not going to, for sake of time, we're not going to go back to Daniel and look at the abomination of desolation being set up. But if you're looking for signs, which is what they asked him about, there's a lot of signs about people being martyred or put to death for the cause of Christ. There's also, when you see the abomination of desolation being set up, then you know things are getting real, and then you know things are getting real close. Okay, he's not saying look to the stars. He's saying look at this event taking place because it's talked about in multiple places because God wants us to know about those things. He's not hiding it from us secretly that only certain special people are going to know the answers of when Jesus is coming back because it's so hidden. They have to come up with some crazy formulas to try to figure it out and set your date. Like the like the um, the Adventists did with the great disappointment, and they set date after date after date after date of oh he's coming back now oh wait we were a little bit wrong in our calculation is and you know he's coming back now and it's 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 interesting morbidly as to why these people after the first disappointment and you're wrong can't just question. Maybe I've been down the wrong path completely. Because they just want, oh, well, oh, it must just be a year off. Or, I, oh, I'm, this, there's this, this problem because nothing happens, right? Jesus didn't obviously come back. So there's something wrong. And they keep kicking the can down the road. I mean, the Jehovah's Witnesses have been doing this for a long time to the point where they had to say, well, he came back, but you just didn't see him. Mm -hmm. Only certain people saw him, and it's kind of the secret thing. And, or he came in spirit and didn't really come in person. It's like, you're just making stuff up. Because you're making predictions. And I talked to someone recently, and it's like, you know, he set a date and said, oh, on this day, it's like, you can never say what's going to happen, but something's going to happen. Which is just like, okay, something happens somewhere in the world, so you're either going to ascribe way more importance to something that happens, or you're just going to say, oh, well, I must have just been a little bit off, and you probably already have a backup of going, oh, well, see, it must be this date then, because that one's, it didn't, Nothing happened the way that I thought it was going to. And I ask, like, when that day comes and goes, and your so-called rapture date doesn't happen, what are you, you know, what are you going to do? Are you going to actually, you know, wake up and see that like you're just completely going down the wrong path, or are you going to just just come up with another date? And unfortunately, so many people just. Well, I'm just going to I'm just going to revise it a little bit cuz I know this is right. If you knew it was right, then it would happen. It doesn't happen cuz you're not right because you're setting a date on something that the Bible didn't give us the information to set a date on. Which is why no man knows the day or the hour. So when you see the abomination of desolation, this is what Matthew 24 says. It says, okay, now it's time to flee. Verse 18 says, Neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes, and woe unto them that are with child, and to them that give a suck in those days. But pray that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day, for then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no nor ever shall be. And again, as a side note, this isn't debunking the, you know, the pre-tribulation rapture, but again, if you're going to look at the Bible for when things are going to take place, or at least information about certain events, and you believe there's a great tribulation, question, why do you use that terminology of great tribulation if when you see the place that talks about the great tribulation, you don't really want to use that because it doesn't support your theory of this pre-tribulation rapture because, oh wait, that's actually only talking to the Jews. But this is where it's talking about the great tribulation. Why do you believe in a great tribulation if you're not getting it from Matthew 24? Let the Bible teach you the truth. Try not to fit your preconceived ideas or, or want to have so much extra wisdom and knowledge that you start applying things that aren't there. Or you have to just dice everything up into portions where it's like, look, this is one whole sermon by Jesus. Don't just start 
chopping it up and saying, well, this applies, this doesn't, but then applies again here, then it doesn't here. It's like, it's a continuous thought. He's telling you the answer to the clear question that his disciples asked him. The sign of your coming and, and the end times and you know, the end of the world. What, what's it? Okay, well, here's a, then they're going to do this and then they're going to do this and then they're going to do this and then they're going to do this. And then, hey, there's going to be great tribulation such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time no one ever shall be and except those days should be shortened there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake those days shall be shortened. Then if any man shall say unto you, lo, here is Christ or there, believe it not. For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets and shall show great signs and wonders insomuch that if it were possible they shall deceive the very elect. And this is another reason why you got to be careful with just turning to the stars and turning to these other sources for your truth because when the Antichrist comes, he's going to have lying signs and wonders. So if you're looking for all of this extra mystical, magical stuff to happen, and you're looking for all these special miracles, you know, it's going to be a lot easier to be deceived by the Antichrist. Now, if you're saved, you're not going to take the mark of the beast, and ultimately no believer is going to be deceived into thinking that the Antichrist is Jesus Christ. But you may be duped for a while into thinking that there's something about them. I don't know. I mean, it's just, if you're looking for those types of things to happen, and then you see, wow, here's somebody doing all these you know, so-called miracles. Stick with the Word of God. Stick with what the Word of God actually says clearly. There's enough there to guide you. You don't need to just go off into all this other stuff. Verse 25 says, Behold, I have told you before, wherefore, if they shall say unto you, Behold, he is in the desert, go not forth. Behold, he is in the secret chambers. Believe it not. Jehovah's Witnesses, he's in the secret chambers. No, he's not. Don't believe it. 27, For as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. You know what? When Jesus Christ comes, every eye is going to see him. There is no questioning his return. There is no doubt to it. It's just like the bolt of lightning that goes... I mean, you can't miss that. It doesn't matter which way you're turning. A bolt of lightning that goes across the entire span, across the entire sky, you can't miss it. Unless your eyes aren't even open. Which is why the Bible says, hey, watch. Flip over to um, Mark 13. I just want to... Man, I'm going... Read all these chapters later. It's really interesting stuff, especially like Bible prophecy. But you know what? We've got plenty of information here to look for, to look for the signs without having to waste your time trying to learn astronomy and figuring out where planets are going to be on any given day. If you spend your time in this book, you will be way more wise than taking all the time to go through all the little models and everything else of figuring out when planets are going to be in alignment. And you'll be much better prepared for the end times events too when you're just in the Word of God. Mark 13, look at verse number 2. And Jesus answering said unto him, Seest thou these great buildings? There shall not be one, left one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives over against the temple, Peter and James and John and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign when all these things shall be fulfilled? And Jesus answering them began to say, Take heed lest any man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And ye shall hear of, of wars, and rumors of wars. Be ye not troubled, for such things must needs be. But the end shall not be yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And there shall be earthquakes in diverse places, and there shall be famines and troubles. These are the beginnings of sorrows. Now, all of those things that happen are all relatively normal events. Earthquakes in diverse just means many places. But earthquakes happen all over the world already. Famines and troubles. It happens. Pestilences, they happen. That's the beginnings of sorrows. Now, I do believe it'll probably start to get a little bit worse as we get, you know, as we get closer and closer. But that's not something that he's really telling you to be, oh man, be looking for that and how many times it happens. He's just saying all of this stuff is going to happen, but don't be troubled. It's not time to start worrying yet when all of these beginnings of sorrows are happening. 
he's kind of downplaying that when they're asking what to look for. Verse number 9 says, But take heed to yourselves, for they shall deliver you up to councils, and in the synagogues ye shall be beaten, and you shall be brought before rulers and kings for my sake and for a testimony against them. And the gospel must first be published among all nations. But when they shall lead you and deliver you up, take no thought beforehand what you shall speak, neither do you premeditate, but whatsoever shall be given you in that hour that speak ye, for it is not ye that speak, but the Holy Ghost. Now the brother shall betray the brother to death, and the father the son, and children shall rise up against their parents, and shall cause them to be put to death. And you shall be hated of all men for my name's sake, but he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. This is consistent throughout all three. We see this teaching of even cutting to, to family, turning and betraying one another. You see events like that happening and being put to death? That's a sign that you're in the great tribulation. That you're in the tribulation because these things are starting to happen. Verse 14, but that's just one. Because things like that have happened before in the past too. I mean, think about the great inquisition where people are being put to death and tortured and stuff um, as, you know, being heretics or whatever against the Catholic uh, faith. It's not just one thing. That didn't mean that the, that the end of, of, uh, of days was yet because it didn't happen. Verse 14, But when ye shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing where it ought not, let him that readeth understand. Then let them which that be in Judea flee to the mountains, and let him that is on the housetop not go down into the house, neither enter therein, to take anything out of his house. And let him that is in the field not turn back again for to take up his garment. But woe to them that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days. And pray ye that your flight be not in the winter. For in those days shall be affliction such as was not from the beginning of the creation which God created unto this time, neither shall be. And except that the Lord had shortened those days, no flesh should be saved, but for the elect's sake whom he hath chosen, he hath shortened the days. And then if any man shall say to you, Lo, here is Christ, or lo, he is there, believe him not, for false Christ and false prophet shall rise and shall show signs and wonders to seduce, if it were possible, even the elect. But take ye heed, behold, I have foretold you all things. But in those days... After that tribulation, the sun shall be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars of heaven shall fall, and the powers that are in heaven shall be shaken. And this is consistent. You can match them up. And we didn't read far enough in Matthew 24, but it basically brings up the same exact event with the sun, the moon, and the stars being darkened. Just like you see in the Old Testament prophets, the same events in the sky in the stars. It's so consistent. When you keep reading that over and over and over again, that should be enough to tell you, okay, if, if, if Luke is saying something about that's a little bit darker of saying the, the, you know, the signs in the skies, but then you read Mark 13 and Matthew 24, and it's specifically now talking about the sun and moon being darkened, that's what he's talking about. That's what it's referring to, that event. Verse 26 says, And then shall they see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. And then shall he send his angels, and shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from the uttermost part of the earth to the uttermost part of heaven. Now learn a parable of the fig tree. And then it goes on with the parable. And at the end it just says in verse 35, Watch ye therefore, for ye know not when the master of the house cometh at even or at midnight or the cock crowing or in the morning, lest coming suddenly he find you sleeping. And what I say unto you, I say unto all, watch. He wants us to watch. Watch for what? There is no reference to watching the sky for some whatever you think is needs to line up. All the information's here. Study this and you'll know. Last place we'll turn, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. I know I'm going way over time tonight. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. But one last place where the Bible says not to be deceived. Remember, the sermon title is End Time Signs to Look For. We started off with what not to look for. If we want to know what to look for, we, we just read through the three best, some of the three best places to look for is when he's describing it. But we also have 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. We're going to start reading verse number 1. The Bible reads, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by our gathering together unto him, which is also known as the rapture, our gathering together unto him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, 
neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us as that the day of Christ is at hand. Don't let people worry you into thinking, oh man, it's going to happen right now. Why does he say that? Verse 3, let no man deceive you by any means. For that day shall not come except. Oh, well, what signs, what, what, what should we be looking for for the end times events to happen? Well, if anyone's telling you it's about to happen, don't let them trouble you. Don't buy into it because this has to happen first. Well, what is it? Except there come a falling away first and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Can somebody please point me to the son of perdition? Now, it's not saying that the son of perdition is, you know, alive. It says he's been revealed. He's been revealed. He's been made known that he is the son of perdition. For all I know, the son of perdition is alive somewhere on the earth right now. I don't know that. But you know what? I'm not going to speculate because I know that this can't happen until he's revealed. You'll know when he's revealed because it's going to line up with all the Daniel prophecies of who the Antichrist is. You could read up in Revelation about him as well. Okay, you could get more information about the Antichrist, but you know what? Until he's revealed, I'm not going to trouble myself with all these other, you know, messages in the stars and date setting and everything else. Because this has to happen first. That they should not come except to come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Who is that? Who is there today that's saying, I'm God, and he's putting himself in the temple of God, saying, nope, I'm God? Because that's the son of perdition. And that's how you know when he's revealed. It's when he starts saying, I'm God. Until then, don't let anybody deceive you. As that the day of Christ is at hand. I mean, but we're almost at the rapture. I'm going to look for the sign that the Bible talks about. I'm not going to be worried that the day of Christ is at hand until someone, at least somebody, is sitting in the temple saying, I'm God. And, and people are actually, you know, not some nut that nobody's listening to <laughs> that might just ram, you know, run into a temple and, oh, I'm God, I'm God. I mean, someone who has influence. Someone who's going to be a world leader. Okay? That's what we should be looking for. You know why? Because that's what the Bible says <laughs> we should be looking for. Let's make this our authority on end times prophecy. Don't waste your time going off down every rabbit trail of, of all these planets and stars and asteroids and, you know, whatever. The Bible warns about that. Read this book more and more and more and you'll start to realize Hey, all the information I need to know is right here. We've got jobs to do. We've got work to do. We need to be aware of these events of end times prophecy. It is important. I said before, it's important. We, we should understand these things. But don't get all carried away just because you think something's interesting into letting yourself get off into all kinds of extra biblical nonsense that who knows who these people are that are spouting off this stuff anyways. Sorry, I'm going to stand on this to give me the guidance that God wants me to have. Let's bow our have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for all the, the knowledge and wisdom that you do give us and that's found in your word. I pray that you please help us to stay pure to our doctrine, stay pure to 
uh, your words, and, and ultimately, Lord, not just our doctrine, but your doctrine, the, the doctrine that's taught in Scripture, that you would help us to make our beliefs and our doctrines conform to your words so that they would be true and that, and that we can hold them in truth, Lord. I pray that you please help us to... Um, just continue to, to proclaim your word and to, and to warn people where the warnings are necessary. And I pray that you please uh, grant us more wisdom and knowledge and that, and that we come to you asking to know more. Lord, please, um, please give us liberally of your wisdom and knowledge. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.